the dog and I are here in historic Richmond, hanging out with the ducks down by the river. The sun's coming in, so I've got to put on the, the shades. Come on, dog. We've come out to Richmond because it's a place of interest and curiosity. It has lots of nice buildings and structures like the famous bridge here with its six arches of sandstone. Richmond also is a place that's frozen in time. For some reason, it was crystallised. And today, people get to claim that it's the best Georgian village in the whole country. But it's also a place of mystery. Back on the historical timeline, people envisaged Richmond as becoming a place that was really big, maybe even the size of a city, but it didn't happen. Due to some sort of accidents or fortunate events, it didn't go in that direction. So what we've got now is this place with these interesting buildings, a lot of prettiness and convict beauty. But what we don't have is a conventional modern Australian town. What we have is a place of tourist intention. For better or worse, that's what we're here for. We're gonna look around and we're gonna enjoy ourselves. Attempts to settle at what became Hobart were troubled right from the start in 1803. Crop failures, saw shortages reached famine proportions. Immigrants, placed by the British military, were ordered to cross the hills east of the Derwent River in search of food, hunting for kangaroo meat. Old documents mention flocks of the now extinct wild emu. So too, the striped hyena. Coming to one of the driest parts of the whole island, land very likely to have been adjusted by fire stick farming for millennia, burning regimes undertaken by the Tasmanian Aboriginals. Coal was discovered along the riverbanks and the district was named Coal River Valley. By 1811, increasing numbers of squatters were tending to sheep and cows. From 1816 came more formal land grants issued by the now British authority. One such grant, was Richmond Park. John Glover visited Richmond Park where he sketched Lord's House. The stately home survived right up until the 1967 bushfires. Today, the crushed ruins are scattered across the grass. In 1824, the Richmond Park Estate gave the township its name when it was in a complicated land deal partly divided in order to create the new place. Richmond itself exists because the authorities decided that a high quality bridge was needed across the Coal River. It opened up access to the Tasman Peninsula and the East Coast. If the bridge had not been erected there, there'd be a different town in a different place. Following a commission of inquiry, the place was chosen in a narrow incised valley between two hard rock barriers. Until that point, Coal River was crossed via fords, shallow places with decent footings where the river could be crossed by wading. At its completion in 1825, it was called Biggie's Bridge, but the name didn't stick with the public. The bridge at the time looked different too, different to how it is now. Within a year or so, the bridge began to fall down, having to be rebuilt in places. Later also saw the parapet raised. And the protective cutwaters were added in 1884. <laughs> Nevertheless, Australia's oldest surviving large bridge continues to serve its original function. And it carries vehicles far heavier than those that even existed anywhere in the world back in the 1800s. The date inscribed in the centre is a more modern addition, placed there to tell visitors that the thing is really old. Several people have been credited as the designers of the bridge, but even less is known of the convict workers who actually did all the yakka. Butcher's Hill was the source of the sandstone for the construction of most of the stone buildings in Richmond. Convicts hauled the stone by handcart, two pulling 
and one pushing. Butcher's Hill is now on private property, but for a long time any old punter could wander up and have a look around. The perfect vantage point of the town was available to all and it was available to the indigenous people before that, who would have sheltered within it. Early European explorers called it the Oven Hills because it was filled with caves and cliffs. The dog and I are walking along this pathway through the water. It's also a dam, and when it was built, it was also meant to be a swimming pool. The Gaddy Dam was constructed in 1935 to create a swimming pool and also a footbridge across the river. Prior to its construction, the Coal River near the bridge was characterised by a shallow stream with a rocky riverbed. After construction, the water level lifted permanently removing the iconic vantage point of viewing St John's Church through the arch. For the first years of its life, Richmond was reached easily by water. The road to the water began at Henry Street, which led into Commercial Road, which led down to the port. So the dog and I are down here on the edge of the Coal River, trying not to slip off this extremely dangerous cliff. We've got Commercial Road that leads down that way. On the map it says Commercial Road and then it sort of bleeds off into a kind of driveway sort of thing. The road's no longer macadamised with modern things like bitumen, it's just a gravel track. If you keep coming down, you get to where you have come to this spot and the reason we're here is because there used to be a jetty here. Now we know that there was a jetty because there are descriptions of it but there aren't any actual photos or paintings, nothing that's come to the surface anyhow. When you're down here you look around the land sort of lifts up a bit and you can sort of feel like goods and services might have come on and off boats that were coming in here. There's no obvious remnants but maybe there is. There's one, two, two posts, and you can see just there, there's a mark that looks to have been made with an ax, I'm assuming. There would have been other pieces of wood running in different directions. And the pillars, or the posts, would have gone further out. At one point in time, this would have been a really busy spot with livestock, and other agricultural goods coming back and forth and going up Commercial Road to Richmond proper. And now it's all just sort of barely a memory. Richmond Jar was built in 1825 as part of the system of policing the outer districts. Inside, transported convicts, bushrangers and Aboriginal warriors were held. The building has been maintained in different ways. A step, fixed by flipping, upside down. In the courtyard, the Cat of Nine Tails was administered. Last used as a jail in 1923, and unlike other similar places in Tasmania, it looks almost just like it did back in the day. So we're down here in the mud of the Coal River, and down here in the bank, there's this thing here, it looks a bit like a pipe, but it's not. It's actually a piece of trash 
but it's been here for so long that it's historically interesting. Built in 1856, a steam-powered flour mill later became a butter factory before becoming derelict. In the 1920s, it was converted into a home and studio. The old boiler was knocked away and rolled into the stream, embedded in the riverbank. Built in 1908, the new town hall is a Frankenstein. It looks older than it is. Cobbled together from the demolished remains at the Richmond Police Barracks, 1826, and the 1827 Tower Windmill, which had arms that had long been a landmark. There were already tracks desire pass through the bush, but the first proper macadamised road to Richmond from Hobart was built in the early 1830s. The earlier route saw people from Hobart take a ferry at Risdon across the River Derwent and then up through Tea Tree Hill. The road was a darling of bush rangers, able to spot victims while feeling safe themselves from the protection of the bush as camouflage. Convict road gangs, some wearing leg irons, worked in the streets. Horses were the main method of transport, pulling wagons and carts. Poorer people walked everywhere. Flocks of sheep and cattle were driven through the village to the sale yards. The pillar of the gate that opened to the old stockyards, stockyards that are now filled with grass. As the town established itself, businesses came about. Eventually blacksmiths, wheelwrights, saddlers, tanneries, a marketplace, brick, and lime kilns. Because of religious prejudices, the inns were either Catholic or non-Catholic. In addition, Richmond appears to have had disorderly houses, perhaps another name for another thing. Within these buildings, black markets generally operated between officials, settlers and convicts. So this building here, it's a home now. Some people live in it and it doesn't have any alcohol serve for money, but it used to be the Jolly Farmers Inn. Now, back in the day, instead of having trucks and cars like we've got going on now, what you'd have is horses, carts, but you'd also have a bunch of people spilling out of the pub that was down on the lower floor on that corner there where the window is where I'm pointing. And they'd spill out and they'd have fights because what is often underlooked about the early period of Tasmania, or more so Van Diemen's Land, is how it was really a place filled with blokes. There weren't a lot of women about. And when you get a bunch of males together and they drink, they pass the time by, they pass the time by fighting. So you get fights that would spill out onto the road and there were fights all up and down town all the time. It was a really common occurrence. It was just part of the culture. Fighting in Tasmanian pubs is something that's almost gone out of fashion now, but only in the last 10 years or so, it's a slow progression. You still get a little bit of it, but it's mostly all gone. This building's extra interesting too, because not only is it a house with a pub at the bottom, but there's something beneath it in what you might now describe as being the basement an original building. Built in stages with a basement brick structure dating back to 1826, the current owners believed that the now cellar was built with an embrasure, the angled aperture built for protection against bushrangers or bad guys. Perhaps also indicative of a raised threshing floor with ventilation for drying hops and grain. As the building was a pub, it would have brewed beer by 1824, violence between Aboriginal people who already lived in the valley nomadically and incoming European settlers escalated to guerrilla warfare. The bloodshed did not decline until after 1830. Full knowledge of the specifics of the violence died with those involved and the reports that we do have were not written by the Aboriginal perspective.
The foundation stone of St Luke's Anglican Church was laid in 1834. So you can see up there, there's a plane going past, but before that, there's the tower, and there's a spot on the tower where a clock is not. When it was built, there would have been thoughts that if they got enough money together, they could put an initial clock face up there, but it never happened. This is one of John Lee Archer's masterworks, one of a whole bunch in Van Diemen's Land. One of the big tragedies of that bloke is that he didn't get to build more. Tasmania today would be a lot richer if he had but maybe he did build more. We know about the official buildings, but there are also probably some unofficial structures that he put up that he did off the books, under the table, and one of these might actually be in Richmond. Prospect House was built in 1830, and it's one of the most attractive homes in Tasmania. The design of the house, however, is a mystery. It's been suggested by some that a sketch for the place has been drawn up by John Lee Archer. St Luke's burial ground is one of the few on the island that have been in continuous use since the early 1800s. The people who colonised Richmond brought their customs with them, and one of those is the style of European burial, placing bodies in graves and covering those graves in headstones. The dog and I here in St Luke's burial ground, We're keeping company with the ravens, giving the right sort of atmosphere. The sun's coming in, so again, I've got to return to the shades. We're here because it's a particularly interesting cemetery in that it has some of the very earliest arrivals from Europe buried here. And it's one of the few cemeteries in the whole island that remains in continuous use right from inception until now. Most early graveyards get used for a while, they get filled up and then uh, yeah they're not used anymore. But there's enough room still here for many more people to join themselves in the soil if that's what they feel like doing. St John's Church was built in 1837 it's the oldest Catholic church still in use in Australia. It has had three spires. The current one was raised in 1972. The land that holds St John's burial ground has moved enough since it began that the stones have moved and folded and broken. Some of the grave sites have been refurbished in recent decades. So the dog and I here in St John's burial ground. And we're here at the grave of Bartholomew Reardon. He's just one of many people from the olden days. You can see he died in 1849, so that's just before Tasmania came to be a place in the administrative sense. This dude was actually born in Norfolk Island and then through circumstances way beyond his control ended up moved down to Van Diemen's Land and this is where his remains are, about eight feet beneath us maybe. A little bit's known about him, too much to go into right now, but it has here mentioned on a separate plaque away from his actual gravestone that he was the victim of having his whole harvest burnt down by malicious scoundrels. Another example of how people throughout history are often remembered by the nasty things that not just that they did, but that happened to them. People are often identified as being victims when there's probably a lot more to them and maybe that's not the best way to remember everybody. In 1872, the opening of the Sorrell Causeway caused Richmond to be bypassed. The same causeway caused the river to silt up and prevent boats from getting up to the jetty. 1874, the town was bypassed by the mainland railway to the north. Richmond was preserved by accidental arrested development. A unity has resulted in Richmond retaining a large number of early buildings and structures. And today, mostly because it's all very pretty, tourists like to come and look. The Hobart Town model village is an attraction. 
a miniature depiction of the capital in the early 1800s. But you can never shrink the past enough to be able to see it all in one glance. The smaller you try to make it, the more unreal it becomes. There are mazes in Richmond where tourists pay to get lost, safe in the knowledge that they can escape any time. Visitors used to be able to find in the middle of it a statue of a minotaur. The fabulous monster hid within the walls. A man-made maze is made to be escaped, but history is the greater labyrinth, the only escapee is time.